All right. Okay, please be seated. <laughs> all right. Okay, sorry, I wasn't observing you, all right? My apology. Okay, such an honor for me and my wife to be here. You know, uh, JB represents uh, uh, something very meaningful to us. Um, we have uh, tons of memory. It is true that uh, we have known your pastor for over a period of 30 years. And uh, more, than, more than him being blessed in knowing me, I suppose I have been more blessed in knowing him, if you understand what I'm trying to say. And uh, I want to thank Pastor Ronnie for this uh, uh, privilege to come and worship with all of us. And uh, hopefully, as we turn our ears this afternoon to hear the living word, I ask the Holy Spirit to speak into your heart. Some of us desperately need to hear a word from the Lord. And I ask God that this afternoon, somehow the Spirit of God will bring alive the written word that you have in your hand, that you will hear this afternoon, and the Word of God, the Spirit of God is able to empower it and make it alive to you. Amen? Now, this afternoon, the title of the message is what I call water experience. Water experience. And uh, we are going to look together from the book of Matthew chapter 14, verse 22 to verse 32. Matthew chapter 14, verse uh, 22 to verse 32. Many of us are very familiar with this portion of Scripture. This is a portion of Scripture that really excites us when we read or when we hear about it. It talks about the experience of Jesus himself walking on the water. And then as the story began to unfold, the passage talks about the opportunity for a man called Peter who had the privilege to walk on the water himself. And as we read this passage together, allow the Lord to speak to your heart. You know, I am never suggesting for us to walk on the water. You know, but the truth is this, at some point of our life, in our walk with the Lord, concerning our private life, concerning our career, concerning our family, even concerning ministry, there will come a time where it is required of us to walk on the water like what Peter did in the book of Matthew chapter 14. Our intention is this. Prior to the occasion where it is required of us to walk on that kind of experience, the intention is for us to be ready, to be clear, to have a measure of understanding in order when it happens to us, when the occasion arises, people of God like you and me, we will know what to do. And knowing what to do is necessary for us to be victorious. Now, Matthew chapter 14, this is what the scriptures say. If you have the Bible, turn with me together to verse 22 onwards. This is what the Bible says. Immediately, Jesus... Uh, made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. Verse 23, And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountains by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. Verse 24, But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the wave, for the wind was contrary. 25, now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. 26, and when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it is a ghost. And they cried out for fear, verse 27, immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. 28, and Peter answered him and said, Lord, 
if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. 29, and Jesus said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. 30, but when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid, beginning to sing. He cried out, saying, Lord, save me. 31, immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? 32, and when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And I guess this is a very uh, necessary reminder for us. Now, as you look at this scripture, I could imagine how excited Peter was. And I think it was uh, like once in a lifetime kind of experience when he was able for a certain period of time during that occasion, walking on the water. The Bible did not suggest how long or how far Peter actually walked on the water. But the Bible clearly stated for our encouragement that Peter actually walked on the water. And it was something that he will remember the rest of his life. It was something that I believe it is like a boost to his faith. It was something like uh, an experience that would cause him physically from a maybe a five, ten footer uh, height of a man to become seven footer height of man, so to speak. It was something that could change the direction, change the destiny of his life. But if you read carefully, if you read carefully in this passage, though the highlight of this passage in Matthew 14 talks about Peter walking on the water. Interestingly, that in the eyes of Jesus, that is not the main highlight. There is a purpose why Jesus permitted Peter to walk on the water. There was an intention. It was like Jesus using this experience of Peter walking on the water as a teaching lesson to the disciples of Jesus Christ. Now, as you read carefully towards the end of this passage, you will realize Jesus threw a very important question. And that question happened to be the cheese, happened to be the foundation, happened to be the highlight of this passage of Scripture. That is what Jesus was aiming at. That was what Jesus was zooming at. And that was what Jesus wanted to educate his disciples. The question that Jesus threw to the disciples or to Peter was this. You know, why is your faith small? Why do you have little faith? Why did you doubt? And that was, that was the statement that was spoken by Jesus the moment Peter cried out to Jesus, Jesus! Help me, I'm sinking. Jesus, the Bible told us, stretched out his hand and pulled him out from the water. And as they walked together towards the boat, Jesus asked Peter, Peter, why your faith was small? Why did you doubt? Now that represents what we want to learn today. That represents the agenda of this message. It is our intention through this message that we will understand the need to strengthen our faith, the need to develop the measures of our faith in order for us to experience the workings of God. Now, this passage, if you read, I believe is enough to stir within us an excitement. What excitement I'm talking about? The excitement I'm talking about this afternoon is this. Jesus gave us a picture it's like a teaser. It is like a glimpse. If only the people of God, if only the disciples of Jesus Christ, it's talking about you and me. If only people of God like you and me have a measure of faith, if we only carry the kind of faith, we position ourselves 
to experience the powerful work of God. That was what Jesus wanted Peter to experience. Because Peter had a measures of faith. That measures of faith permitted Peter to experience God. And in our life, many times, we need that measures of faith. We need that act of faith because when we have that measures of faith, when we have the act of faith, then we position ourselves to experience the works of God. We position ourselves to experience the power of God. We position ourselves to experience God in our life. Hallelujah. We are talking about what Jesus said. Why is your faith small? Why did you doubt? Notice here, sometimes when you read that statement of focus, you know, just a, a passing reading will perhaps give us an impression that Jesus was scolding Peter. Do you think so? Was Jesus condemning Peter? Hey, Peter, you know why your faith is so small? You know, I do not know the tone that Jesus used to speak to Peter then. But when I read this message, I'm glad the way Jesus presented his point to Peter. I'm glad that Jesus never said, Peter, why you have zero faith? Notice what Jesus said. Jesus told Peter, he has small faith. Small faith is better than zero faith, my friends. And the truth is this, all of us have small faith. We have a measures of faith. Romans chapter 12 verse 3 promise us that every believer, young or old, from the point of conversion, we carry a measures of faith, small faith. The question is not about whether we have or we are absence of faith. The question that is pertinent this afternoon is what we do with the measures of faith that we have. And Jesus giving us an understanding through this encounter, when we have enough faith, great things we will experience God. No wonder Jesus told the disciples, when you believe, speak to the mountain to be removed, it shall be removed. The question is, what are we doing with the faith that we have? Yesterday night, I was talking, sharing with the Bahasa group. I was explaining what measures of faith is. Measures of faith is like this. It is something that is alive. Faith is something that is alive, that can increase and can decrease. And if we don't do anything about our faith, our faith may remain stagnant, but more often than not, because we fail to guard our faith, we fail to nurture our faith, we fail to work on our faith, surely with the distraction that comes, surely with the, uh, with the attack of what the devil brings into our life, with the fear that comes, uh, with the doubt that comes, with the unbelief that comes, surely the measures of faith may even go further down. But church, we need to increase the faith. We need to come to a point of having this understanding that, hey, I need to increase my faith. Having the desire to increase faith and doing nothing about it is foolishness. And this afternoon, this is what the passage here will teach us. How in simple understanding, we can strengthen our faith. I'm sure the believers in this appointed church, we desire to have faith. Isn't it true? We need the workings of God. You know, many of my personal victories takes place as a result of an act of faith. Many. Without which, I can still be dreaming about it. I can still be crying about it. I can still be whining about it. But thank God for the small measures of faith that exist within me, that exist in all of us, that if we were to work on the measures of faith, we position ourselves 
to experience greater works of God. How should we develop it? This is where we are going to focus on this passage, Matthew chapter 14, 22 to 32. Amen? The first basic understanding. We need to know Jesus. We need to know him. Now, it's very interesting in this story. In this, it's not a story, it's a real life, in, the, the, a real incident that took place. Jesus was walking towards the disciples on the water, and he was on the fourth watch. The fourth watch simply means an estimated time of 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. That is what fourth watch represents. And the disciples from a distance, they thought they saw somebody. They thought they saw somebody. And they cried out in fear, it is ghost. And their heart was gripped with concern because it blew their mind, how can it possibly be? And then Jesus heard the conversation among the disciples. And Jesus said, fear not, it is me. And we all know what Peter said in response, right? Peter said, if truly it is you, call me and I'll walk towards you on the water. Now, very interesting, very interesting. How can it be possible that the 12 disciples failed to recognize it was the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you thought about it before? How can it be that they have lived together with Jesus for a season of time, they have uh, heard Jesus talk. They have seen Jesus physically. They knew how Jesus conduct himself. They traveled together. Yet that point of time, in Matthew chapter 14, they failed to recognize it was Jesus. Now, if we want our faith, measures of faith to grow, we need to know God. If we do not know God, our faith will never grow. You know that you may say, but Pastor, he was at the third watch, sorry, fourth watch, 3 a.m. to 6 a.m., pretty dark, huh? Pretty dark. Well, let, let's assume it was pretty, pretty dark. But perhaps, you know, in an unpolluted environment, you go to the village, if any one of you come from village, you will understand. When there is lesser pollution, you can see more stars in the sky. Isn't it true? And the, sky, the stars or the moon provide some gleams of uh, uh, lightings for the, for the disciples to have a look who is walking towards them. But let's assume there was no stars. There was no, what do you call that, moon. You know, that appeared on that particular night. And it was dark, and uh, yeah, they can't see. Therefore, it is, you know, excusable. You know, friends, believers, we are good at giving excuses. Huh? Thank God, the appointed church members, we don't give excuse when God calls us to act by faith. Thank God. But isn't it strange for the disciples to embark on their boat journey without bringing kerosenes or lightings materials? It is strange. It is highly unlikely for fishermen like Peter, Andrew, John, and James embarking on a sailing trip empty-handed without bringing kerosene or oil for the purpose of lighting. Even when there is no lights in the sky, there will be sufficient lightings in the boat that permits them to see a distance from their eyes. How can they not know it was the Lord Jesus? When you do not know the Lord, you will not move by faith. When you know the Lord, you will move by faith. But you will say, a Pastor, Jesus probably was so far away. So when a distance away, I can't really see how the sister behind looks like, you know. And uh, she looks blurry to my eyesight. Well, 
possible, isn't it true? Again, we come up with some reasons and excuses not to act by faith. But do you realize that they could hear Jesus, you know? And Jesus could hear them. And obviously, if Jesus could hear them, and they could hear Jesus, I believe the distance may not be too far away from one another. And even though they may not see the face of Jesus, when they heard the sound of Jesus, they should have known it was Jesus. Any married couple here? I know uh, Lisa and Iwi, you are married. I'm sure there are other married couple. Husband, never do like what Peter has done or else you'll be in deep trouble. You know, your wife call you, you know, from you know, another from the other room or over the phone. Can you imagine the wife, your, our wife call me, my wife call me, you know, and uh, without introducing herself. And, uh, and uh, I, 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 I answer the call. I say, yes, who are you? <laughs> May I know who are you? You know. Now it is almost unimaginable for us not to know because the identity appears in our phone. Turn the clock 30 years ago, when everything was analog, you know, the phone that we use in the house is something that we have to dial. And uh, there's no way the ID will appear and you only recognize the person with the sound of their voice or when they introduce themselves. Husband, when we talk to our wife, we don't need to introduce ourselves. Wife, when we talk to our husband, we don't introduce ourselves because if we do that, something is wrong with us. And the disciples ought to know it was the voice of the Lord. Now, what is the lesson here? We need to know the word. We need to know the word of the Lord. The more we know the word of the Lord, trust me, my friends, your faith stands on a position of expansion. When we fail to know the word of God, what we experience when it is called upon us to go through will remain just a dream for us. We will miss the powerful works of God we will miss the potential that God can bring into our life. We miss the blessings of the Lord. We miss the victories of the Lord. We need to go back to the Word. Romans chapter 10, verse 17, faith comes by hearing. Hearing the Word. Now, it's interesting. If you, it, does it mean every time you read the Word of God, you have faith? Some of us have read the Bible Pages to pages, front to back, maybe five, ten times, twenty times. Technically, we should have faith bigger than Goliath. But interestingly, in reality, is it true that it doesn't seem to be happening in us? So what does that scripture mean in Romans chapter 10, verse 17? Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. It means this. When we read the word of God, when we hear the Word of God, it gives us knowledge of the Word of God. Knowledge by itself will not inspire faith. Trust me, friends. And I ask you, John 3, 16, what does the Scripture say? Instantly we lift our hands, for oh, God so loved the world. But does it inspire faith? It produces knowledge. But if you don't read the Word of God, if you hide the Bible at the corner of your handphone or in the deepest part in the storage house, in the storage room in the house, then in the absence of reading the Bible, there will be absence of knowledge. When you have knowledge, only you will have understanding of the word. And sometimes when we read the Bible, we read without understanding the scripture. And only when we understand the scripture, that understanding produce truth. That truth, that stage, is when faith takes place. So when we read the Bible, friends, I know the heart of God now. 
I know the plans of God now. I know the power of God now. I know the intentions of God now. I know what God wants me to do now. I know what, what I need to be prepared now. And when that knowing takes place, faith arises. That's the first thing. But the question is, are we reading the Bible, friends? Thank God you guys read the Bible faithfully at least five chapters a day. You know, I, it's very interesting. We, I, we, we embarked on this project to encourage the church members to read the Bible. And I, we did an experiment. Do you realize if you were to only read two chapters a day on the average length of the scripture, per chapter, probably about 20 over verses, huh? It doesn't take you more than 10 minutes to complete two chapters, you know. Doesn't take you more than 10 minutes to complete two chapters of the Bible reading. And over a day, we have about 3,600 over minutes. Am I, did I calculate correctly? 24 hours and 60? Oh, my maths, I think I got it complicated, right? You know what the calculation is all about. 10 minutes, come on friends. 10 minutes out of that thousands of minutes a day, you can surely do better than that. We can give God the time because you know why? What is important is my faith must develop. When I know God loves me, my faith develops. When I know God is going to act for me, my faith develops. When I know God is going to give me victory, my faith develops. When I know God forgive my sin, my faith develops. When I know God is going to perform miracle, my faith develops. The absence of knowing God doesn't profit us at all. Number two, from Matthew 14, 545, right, Deborah? Correct, yeah. <laughs> okay, 455 now. Number two, second simple understanding how we can nurture our faith. We need to step out. I, I think many of us are fearful of this, stepping out. Huh? You know, Peter actually stepped out. That's the reason why he walked on the water, the rest didn't walk on the water. Now, I like about this part, stepping out into the water. I love it so much. You know, before we just elaborate further, now, I just want to bring your mind back here Bring attention, capture attention by imagining with me when Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 14 walked on the water. Now, often when you read this passage, we tend to focus on Peter's experience, not on Jesus, right? But Jesus also walked on the water. In fact, he walked on the water first, then Peter walked on the water. But do you have you thought about this? Now, when Jesus at the shore and uh, he told himself, I'm going to go to my disciples, I'm going to walk on the water, assuming that was what happened in his mind, that, how, that was how he talked. He took a first step onto the water and he was actually floating. He was actually walking on the water. Again, please don't do so. Don't go to Sungai Seget and do so. You will drown. You know, and uh, do you think Jesus was surprised? Hey, I didn't know I can walk on the water. Leh. Do you think Jesus say that to himself? Wow, what a miracle. I actually can walk on the water. I never knew I can walk on the water. No, right? It was something that we can accept. People who believe Jesus, is something that we can accept. The fact that nothing is impossible for God. It is true. Mark chapter 10 tells me, for with men, there are many things that are impossible, but not with my God. Amen? For all things are possible for him. So when we think about Jesus walking on the water, well, he is God, so it's fine. But when Jesus called Peter to come towards him, walking on the water, when Jesus saw Peter walk on the water, 
What do you think was the thought in the mind of Jesus? Peter, you actually walk on the water. Surprise, surprise, surprise. Does your Bible say that? No. What is the message here? The message here is this. Jesus already knew Peter can walk on the water because it was the power of God that came into Peter that permitted Peter to walk on the water so much so like the walking on the water has a physical platform to sustain his physical way. It was not a surprise. It was not a surprise for Jesus when you trusted the Lord, obeying the Lord to do whatever the Lord tells you through his word, and miracle happened, nothing surprised God. The victory that you're hoping for, that you eventually receive, not a surprise. The healing that you receive, not a surprise. Because Jesus knew when God's people like you and me respond by faith, yes, miracle will happen. But then that is God. What about us? Oh, very interesting. I want to throw this understanding to us. You know, I hope that this will, capture, will be captured in your heart. This truth that helps me. Do you know Jesus always asks you to do the easy part? He never asks you to do the difficult part. Jesus or the Word of God, when command us to act by faith, to do as per the instructions of the Word, often it is to command us to do the part that is easy enough for us to execute. Jesus never tells you to do something that you cannot do. Do you believe that? Jesus never asks you to be a savior. Thank God. Otherwise, all of us will fail miserably. Jesus asks you to only be the witness of Savior. Something you and me can do. He never asks you to die on the cross. He only asks you to carry the cross. Can you carry the cross? Who said I cannot carry the cross? Jesus only asks you to pray and believe. He will do the rest. Which is easier? Pray, believe, or execute it. Do you understand the point that I'm stressing here? God told Joshua, I'm going to cause you to cross over Jordan River. Was it difficult? Yeah, difficult. It was flooding. There are things that happen in our life that God is telling you to do. And it looks very difficult to do. But in truth, it is something within your reach. And what the people in Joshua's time needed to do is to stretch their leg, their feet, and go into the water. Can they do that? Yes. Come on, friends. When Joshua and the Israelites were called to march around the Jericho wall, the Lord never told them to destroy the wall. It happened to be a thick wall, well-guarded, well-marshaled. The people of the, of the land was well-equipped, well-trained. God never asked them to crumble the, the wall. God told them to walk around the wall. Can, do, can they walk? Yes. Can you pray? Yes. Can you give? Yes. Can you forgive? Yes. Can you love? Yes. Can you serve? Yes. What else God has called you to do? That we tell God, it is so difficult that I cannot do it. It is a lie. 
turn to the person next to you, it is a lie. Now, I remember one time in 2019, my son finished his study 2018 end. Is it 2018 end? Probably, yeah. 2018 end. Finished his study, came back, came back, and uh, it was a bad, bad, bad time. Bad time. Economically, you know, and he happened to graduate uh, in petroleum engineering, so it was like a sunset industry. People are being laid off, you know, retrenchment. You know, thousands and upon thousands of uh, oil and gas workers lost their job. It was difficult. And uh, he applied. You know, it's very frustrating for young graduates when you apply for jobs and there is no response. It makes you feel that you are not good enough. Isn't it true? You know, there was zero response. I was driving one day back from my mom's place towards my house. And uh, incidentally, my nephew, you know, also graduated in the same line, you know, under Petronas scholarship. And uh, because of the bond... He got a job, and uh, I'm quite sure my son will feel it, you know. So, you know, on my way back, driving, I, I, I told the Lord, Lord, speak to me. Speak to me. Now, I was driving past a Chinese cemetery, China, of all places. Huh? God speaks anywhere, by the way. I heard the Spirit of God speaks to me. Now, I knew it was the Spirit of God speaking to me. Because when God speaks to us, He speaks consistently. Do you realize God doesn't change His tone when He speaks to you? Amen? You know why He doesn't change His tone when He speaks to you? He doesn't want you to confuse. He wants you to know it is Him and Him alone speaking to you. Husband, you don't change your tone, right, when you speak to your wife. And all of us have our distinctive tone. The way God speaks to me is this way. The way God speaks to you is the other way. It doesn't matter. And I heard the Spirit of God tell me, My son, don't worry. Don't worry. For I prepared something good for him. It was a word. It was a word. And I just needed to act in faith by God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. It changed my inspired perspective. It changed my attitude. It changed how I conduct myself when there is zero response for Him. It changed everything because I heard from the Lord. And God only told me to, to just give thanks. I can do that. It's an easy job. Give thanks. What's so difficult in giving thanks? Give thanks, friends. What's so difficult if you have to pay your tithes? Pay your tithes. Did I touch on somebody's nerve? No, right? Let's step out. Let's step out. You know, in John, James chapter 2, James chapter 2 give us an understanding of what faith is. It says in chapter 2 of verse 20, 22, Faith without works is dead. Right? Now, understand here, works here doesn't mean you go and do charity work. No, no. Okay. The works here is seen in the context of the declaration of faith and the act of faith must be consistent. This is what I mean. If I say I believe God hears my prayer, the works required is, I must pray. If I believe salvation is of the Lord, apart from the Lord, no one goes to heaven, my acts, my works is, I must make sure I tell people about it. My declaration of faith and my action must be consistent. When my declaration of faith and my act is not consistent, then it becomes a dead work. The word dead work here means you missed and I missed the potential of the working of God. 
The intentions of God is for us to experience God. But because of the failure on our part to act according to faith, meaning consistent, what I say and what I do must reflect consistency. If I fail to do that, it becomes a dead work. I miss the works of God. I miss the healings of God. I miss the works of God in my home. I miss the, 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 the intervention of God in my career. I miss God completely. But we need to step out. But there are many believers who do not want to step out. Many believers are theoretical believers. Thank God you are not. Many believers, I can imagine what transpired in the boat, you know. After Peter and Jesus walk into the boat, I can imagine after they settled down, you know, they were asking Peter, do you think they asked Peter, Peter, how he felt? Huh? Do you think so? It was not recorded, but I am not surprised, right? Some of them are, are, are capo fellas, you know, they were ask, hey, Peter, how was it? You know, and Peter will be, oh, you were fantastic out of the world experience. You know, when I walk on the water, you know, it was so, it was so, uh, you know, it was beyond description. It was like I was just walking on a wooden plank. It was fantastic, Peter was saying. And some of his friends turned around. But Peter, you actually sang, you know. Now, if I were you, Peter, I were you. There are many, if I were you, believers in the church. If I were you, Peter, you know, I would not look at the storm. You know, the way I walk would have been different from you. I would have done it this way. I would have performed it this way. I would look straight to Jesus. But they never walk. There are many talkers in the church, except appointed church it is. Many talkers. We are good in commenting. We are good in warming the church. But friends, the experience is in the water. It's never in the boat. God wants to do something in us. And there are many, for some of us, the, the breakthrough is when we step out. I thank God, God taught me that He always asked me to do the easy thing. Easy thing. Never the difficult thing. That's number two. Number three. I'm way ahead of my schedule, thank God. Number three. Number one is we need to know the Lord through the Word. Okay. If you hear weird voices, please understand it is most often than not, it's not the Word of God. Go back to the written Word of God. God works in line with the Word of God. Okay? Number two, step up. We need to step up. Number three, we need to prepare for the storm. We need to be ready for the storm. Do you realize to us, the, uh, in, the, in this passage in Matthew chapter 14, Peter, as he was walking, he was able to walk, but because of the storm that came, he failed in his attempt eventually. <clears throat> Let's talk about the storm. All of us intend to experience God, but not every one of us are prepared to face the storm. Because in every experience with God, in every victories that God has prepared for us, they're bound to be storms that we may need to go through. And some of the storms can last for an extended time. Some of the storms may require you to fast and pray through. Some of the storms may require you to act in faithfulness. Many of our victories happen years later. And the failure of believers not to be ready to face the storm will make us unable to sustain the water experience. It is true that often at the first try, 
first attempt to walk by faith, we want and we expect success. It is true. Anyone expect failure? Anyone, when you pray, God help me, you don't want to see God helping you no more. All of us, at the first very attempt, when we walk by faith, pray for the sick, for example, pray for the sick, for example, we want to see healing, we don't want to see death. But yet the truth is this, there are storms that will come our way and the storms have one intention, to create fear, to create doubt, to create unbelief. So as we walk by faith, as we want to develop our faith, we need to learn how to face the doubt, unbelief, and fear that will surely come knocking at our door. But what if we fail on the first attempt? You know, it's interesting, Christians, when we fail in our first attempt, we give up. We consider this as, we consider the failure as testimony, confirmation, confirmation, ordained, you know, uh, written on the stone, cannot be modified anymore, chopped, secure, sealed, that it is not God's will for me to do this. Is that true? First time I pray for the sick, nobody gets ill. Confirm, I'm not called to pray for the sick. Oh, I start giving tithes, I don't see provisions. I will confirm the tithing instruction is for our brother only, not for me. The first time I call upon God, believing God for a miracle in my family, nothing seems to happen. Confirm, confirm, I'm not called to pray, called to be intercessor. We are not prepared for failures, you know. We are not ready to face the challenges, the strike of fear, the strike, the arrows of doubt and unbelief is real. I remember, you know, when I was disciplining myself to live healthily, a lot of bombardment in my mind to tell me to do otherwise. I decided to go for a walk in the park near my housing area. And that was not an easy attempt. I told myself I'm going to walk three rounds, which is about three kilometers. Small, small, small matter for some of us, but it was a big issue for me after long years of missing physical exercise. I remember when I reached the park, you know, I got ready in the car, wore my shoe. And I tried to open the door of my car. I seemed to have trouble opening the door of my car. It was unlocked. But it was like there was a pressure from the outside pushing my door inwards. No matter how hard I tried to push the, open the door of my car, I cannot open it. It was not like somebody is pushing the door of my car it was the thought in my mind that was pushing the door of my car. The thought says, I have no need la, tomorrow. La. Isn't it true? And I fought it. I fought it. It was a real battle. I fought it. You know, and I managed to successfully open the door of my car and I walked first round, coming to the end of the first round, I was so pleased with myself. I pet myself. Hallelujah. But I told myself I'm going to walk three rounds, right? From far before I ended the first round, I saw my car. I knew the location of my car. And the voice that came to me was so strong. It was calling me from the car. Figuratively speaking, eh? I'm not preaching heresy here. Come back to the car. Second round next day, third round next day. You understand what I'm trying to say here? We are not prepared to, to handle challenges. 
We do not know what to do when fear, doubt, unbelief, discouragement hits us. We do not know what to do. This is why Jesus said we must build ourselves with the word of the Lord. Remember Jesus said in Matthew 7, 24 to 32, I believe, Jesus said all of us are builders. We are builders. Some of us are students. You may be an engineer. You may be an accountant. You may be a teacher, computer science, or you, your own career. But all of us are spiritual builders. And we're building our life. Some of us look beautiful, beautiful, tip-top, beautiful. We spend fortune on our physical being. Thank God we are not Korean. Huh? Otherwise, we will go to the extent of improving our physical look. But we put a lot of effort. But the strength is absence. It's hollow. Jesus said the building must be on a foundation of the Word. Only the word can sustain the storm that comes. No word, trust me friends, you will be shaken. You know, there were times where as I heard the word of the Lord, that he has prepared something good for my son. There were, in, there were discouragement that still come because I had to wait for another good about Four more months before that miracle happened. Four more months. There were nights that I was so frustrated. There were nights that I was becoming disillusioned. There, was night, there were nights when I see how my son responded in his young age. I became very troubled. But yet, uh, the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord was the one that kept me. It was like I'm standing on the word of God. I was like holding on to the Word of God. I was like grabbing. It was like I am just surviving on the Word of God. The thoughts came bombarding. What if we fail at the first attempt? Try the second attempt. What if on the second attempt of the journey of faith, we fail? Fail here. You look at this. It is not a God... It's unable. It is not. It is Peter that was fearful. So the honors, the, the problem is not on God's side, so to say, so to speak. It's our problem. First round I fail, I make sure second round I do it again. But don't do the same. Hello. Take time to know where I have gone wrong for the first round. I remember one time I was leading a team of a uh, 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 believers for a trip to Indonesia, Kalimantan. How many of you have heard about Kalimantan, right? Uh, the future new capital city of Indonesia. So we were in this city of Pontiana, all right, the name of the city, and we went to this interior village. And that night, it was a revival meeting, and, uh, you know, one of, one of our team members preached, and I interpreted for him, for her, sorry, and I felt I felt very strongly that evening, the Lord told me, the Spirit of God told me that He's going to heal someone day with a throat problem, throat problem. Throat problem. It's fine. I have, a, I have a policy in my life that I hold on dearly and I try my best to practice. What policy is that? You speak, I obey. You instruct, I do. Tell me to go to where, I will go. Tell me what you want me to do, I will do. No question asked. I tried that policy in my relationship with God. And that night, I felt very strongly the Spirit of God. I knew it was the Lord because same tone, same voice speaking to me as in the past. So I was very bold, very gung ho -an. When I was much younger, I very... Uh, the Hokkien say, uh, uh, he died, so I told the people before the sister preached, I said, the Lord just told me that he's going to heal somebody with a throat problem. 
Tuhan berbicara kepada saya Indonesia. Tuhan berbicara kepada saya ada seorang pribadi di sini yang sakit bahagian leher. Tuhan mau sembuhkan. Adakah sesiapa di sini? So one lady came out. Then another older lady came out. When I saw the second older lady came out, I was terrified. I was really fearful because I was expecting so truth only. You understand what I'm trying to say here? I was literally expecting sore throat. God healed the sore throat. I got faith for that, no? God healed the sore throat. But when the lady came out, the nene lah, ibu yang came out, she was having goiter. Do you know what's goiter? A growth over the neck. My heart dropped. You know, if the sea level to the base of the sea is 1,000 meters, it dropped, tum, zero gone case for me. But I need to jaga my face. The lady walked out, so I told my team members, come on, let's surround this Ibu, let's pray together. So we actually prayed together. I quoted whatever scripture I can remember, by the strap of Jesus be healed. In Jesus' powerful name. I told the members, pray together. They all prayed. But as I was praying, my hand was touching her goita. Verbally, I was praying. But do you know what was happening in my mind? This was what happened in my mind. As I was praying, God, Tuhan, sembuhkan dia, heal her. The thoughts in my mind, why is still so big, the goita? Literally, friends. It is still there. My mind was telling me. It's like laughing at me. Sounds familiar to us? The storms that comes, the wave that comes, whether we are strong or we are not strong, the wave will come. The building, whether you build properly or you don't build properly, the flood will surely come. And I was discouraged. I was discouraged. And after praying, I, I, I lift up my hands. I said, I asked the Ibu, Ibu, coba Ibu, periksa macam mana keadaan Ibu. But I knew it was bad for me. The Ibu said, macam biasa saja, you know, like nothing. So I told Ibu, Ibu, macam ada kurang sikit ya, Ibu. So I said to my team members, let's pray again. We did the same thing. And the end of the story was this. Nothing happened. I went back. But of course, subsequently that night, there were other miracles. But that particular incident struck me. And I went back to the, to the pastor's house that we were staying. I was telling myself, what happened? What happened? What did I miss? I began to analyze. I actually began to ask God, God, the next round, if there's a goiter, I must see it happen. Where did I go wrong? Did I permit fear to grip my heart? Did I permit unbelief to grip my heart? Did I fail to respond to the thoughts that comes my way? Did I fail to respond to the discouragement? Now, friends, discouragement is so real. Thank God, members in the point of church never go through discouragement. But it is real, just in case you have never gone through discouragement. It is so real. Church, we must learn to handle challenges. It will come. The word is our strength. I pray that you will experience God in God's power. I pray you will do that. But if you don't have the word, it will not sustain you. I'm not asking you to go to Bible college, friends. I'm asking you to read the word. I'm asking you to be like the Word. I'm asking you to become like the Word. I'm asking you to act like the Word. Some of our characters are so unlike the Word. Some of our characters are literally the characters that the Word tells us not to have. Some of our emotions are so weakened 
So much so it is as if that Jesus had not died on the cross for us. How can it be, friends? Be ready for challenges, amen? The church here, Pointed Church, will surely face challenges. You as an individual believer face challenges. But I thank God, I thank God, I thank God that in the midst of the challenge, that's where God manifests himself. Amen? In the midst of the challenges, I always tell my friends, look for treasures in the challenges. Treasures. When you go to Myanmar, it seems there are precious stones along the road those days. But you cannot pick it up. It's an offense. For believers here, when you walk through the valley of the shadow and death, look for the treasures of the presence of God. Look for the treasures of the grace of God. Look for the treasures of the power of God. Look for God's work in the midst of your challenges because God will surely appear. He never missed you. We only missed him. Are you going to be ready for challenges? How would you react the next round when storm hit you? You know, I just heard somebody told me this. The member, one of our pastor, was sharing this with me. I'm going to close after this. One of, the, one of our pastors was telling me, he said, Pastor V, you know, one of our members says this. Now, the more I pray, the more I become wanting to become committed, the more challenges I face. Thank God for the challenges. Thank God for the challenges. Because God will never abandon people of God who walk through challenges. I want to close with this story. And then we will pray together. Is that okay? It's 5.27. I'll try to finish by 5.30 and pray for you guys if you can, if I can. I remember in 1995, I felt so convinced in my heart. The, the Lord told me it is time to go full time. I was 26 years old. I wanted to go full time at the fourth year of my university studies. I was so convinced that the Lord called me. In, the, in our students came in Port Exeter, I spoke to a pastor. And I told him I wanted to resign, quit my studies and go full time. And he gave me a word of wisdom. Thank God, I, he gave me that word. He told me, you have basic responsibility to finish your study at least to bear the testimony of God, to honor God in whatever you do. That is the face of your life. So I took it as it is. I finished my study. And I worked. I was working in Sinai for a good three years. And I told the Lord, as long as I work, I want to do well. You know, believers, we need to do well. If you are a student, be a good student. Don't be a lazy student. If you are a career man, businessman, make sure you are so good that the people will adore you. Not worship you, right? Adore you, you know. And, uh, and uh, somehow the favor of God was there. In a matter of three years, there seems to be good times and promotion. And I remember before I left, six months before I left, my, uh, our chairman of the company Today is a public listed company. Met me in his office. He told me this. We, you know, please get ready. We're going to position you in this new position. And uh, your current uh, 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 factory manager will be relocated to Indonesia for another project. We're expecting you to assume the position later. Sounds very nice. Sounds very nice. Very nice. And uh, he told me, we, you are driving motorcycle. How can you? It's a typical Chinaman. I was driving Honda EX, you know, staying in a uh, street scooter, you know, staying in Tunamina, going to Sunai. By the time I reach office, I don't need perfume anymore. I have a dust perfume, you know. And uh, he said, I'm going to give you 10,000. 
free loan. I don't know what's free loan, but it's a free loan. No interest needed. Pay as you wish, whenever you want. I said, it sounds so good. But within that six months, after that period, the prompting becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. And I knew it was time. It was difficult. When you got nothing, it is easier. You know, I always tell people, if you want to go full-time, go full-time earlier. Don't go full-time later because you've got lesser commitment. That's for me, not for you, all right? And I pick up strength and courage after six months of seeking the Lord, struggling. I say, God, I'm going to quit. Tender my resignation. I spoke to the pastor of the church, Joe Barrow. I told him, Pastor, I need to come full-time. He said, okay. He asked me how much I was getting. I said I was getting that figure. And, and he said to me, we can't pay you that. You know? We can only pay you 10% of what you were getting. 10%. Being the man of God, I told him, Pastor, I'm here not for money. Sounds very... <sighs> I'm here to serve the Lord. Even if you don't pay me, I will serve the Lord. But then, I needed to do one more thing. I needed to tell my parents that I am going full time. I needed to do that. I had a clear word. I was like Peter walking on the water. You know. I'm not sure how I can survive with the 10%, but there was another storm coming my way, and the storm was worse than the 10% uh, love gift. I called my parents. They were inclined. I told them, you know, Mom, I... Quit my job. And my mom said, oh, great, great. Can you believe it? She said, great. Because then she said, so uh, what is the next company? How much salary, higher salary they're paying you? That was normal reaction. Well, I say, well, I'm going to work in church. They were non-believers. And for a moment, a few seconds, that seems to be like, Minutes long, there was silence. And then there was a loud scream. It says this, I warn you, pack your bags, come back to Klang right now. Wow. Now, for your context, I happen to be the only son in a Chinese family, happen to be the youngest, not the spoiled one, but the youngest. So a lot of expectation were placed on me. And uh, predominantly, my, my mother's side of family, they are strong, strong Buddhism believers. I thank God I was not inclined that time. I thank God I was in Tunamina at that time. And uh, I did not go back that night. I went back a few, few days later. So I went back. Before I went back, the pastor prayed for me. I was prepared. I'm going to serve God, man. I'm going to walk on the water. So I met a friend of mine, a co-worker in the church. He said, brother, tell me what you went through when you came full-time. You know, he told me, well, my problem coming full-time is nothing, but when I came to know the Lord, it was tough. He said this, my father took a hockey stick and beat me up. That scared me, The police came because the neighbors lodged a complaint. The police asked my friend, do you want to lodge a report against your dad? He said, no. My father has the right to beat me. But I was comforted. Though I was terrified, I was comforted because none in my family play hockey. <laughs> so there's no hockey stick. The most is there's a broom. I said, broom, nothing. Something that I can sustain. I'm talking about preparing for a storm. And I was traveling from Johor Bahru back to Klang. And for the first time in my entire family, we had a conference meeting. Family meeting. And I was prepared. Really, friends, we need to be prepared. Tough times will come. And I was telling myself, no matter what they do, they say, I will be firm. 
serve the Lord. Today, I have served the Lord slightly above 25 years. I got a long way more to go. But that night, something happened to me that really shook me. I was expecting sticks. I was expecting abusers, quote unquote. I remember my dad was saying to me, you know, they call me Philip, my, my household name, they call me Philip. You don't, you will not even have enough money to buy milk for, milk for milk powder for your kids next time. Very true. Pastors are expected to be poor then. I can't blame him. But do you know today, not only we have enough money to provide milk powder for them, two of our kids, we only have two, two of our kids were provided scholarship for their overseas education. And we are so thankful. Thankful. We realized if I continue to even work in the factory there, retract my resignation, climb up the ladder, I don't have the means. Two million to finance my kids. I don't have. But something happened that night that really unsettled me. You know what happened? My mom started crying. That was not something that I prepared myself for. I prepared myself for violence. Not violence, physical act or abusive act. But my mom cried. If you have a surviving parents, never make your parents cry because of you. It's very heartbreaking. And I, I, I cannot, for a moment, I almost say, okay, I delay for a moment, I almost, it is like, because I saw the tears. But I swallowed it back. I said, no, you won't understand. I won't expect you to understand. I was, don't know how I communicate to them in Mandarin or in Hokkien and then. And uh, they told me this, if you still persist with this, from today onwards, you are no longer our son. Painful. The storm was terrible. You know, I was not a, a, like a manja-manja type of uh, brother or son to my, my family, but family is important to me and to you. So they told me, first thing in the morning, pack your bags and go back. I have no choice. I pack my bag. Next thing in the morning, I, I, I walk from my home. Nobody sent me. I have to walk to the train station or bus station get a ticket and intentionally board, you know, the VI, super VIP bus. Super VIP bus sitting is one seat, two seats. I don't know whether you still have it nowadays. Then my time. And I choose the one that with one seat. You know why? Throughout the journey, I was looking outside the window. I was so broken in my heart. Really broken. The storm was so great. I was crying, you know. The journey was about four hours plus from Kuala Lumpur to Johor Bahru. Shedding tears, I said, God, God, help me. God, help me. I was walking on the water. It was an act of faith. Walking on the water. I want to experience God, but the storm was there. I said, God, help me. When I reached Johor Bahru, I rested in my home. The next day, I report to office. There was this devotion, staff devotion. So I went. I remember my pastor was asking me, so V, how did it go? In the midst of everybody asking me this question. So how? I just broke down. I just broke down. It was painful. You know, I remember he said this. Greater the challenges, greater the workings of God. We just need to hang in there. So I, my heart, when I heard that, I said, easy for you. But I held in there. 
and I, I did my part. I called my home. When they hear my voice again, no ID appear, right? When they hear my voice, they will hang the phone. Not a nice feeling, huh? The storm was great, though. But thankfully, I did not sing, even though physically I don't know how to swim. But thankfully, I did not sink. Friends, today, some of us, we need to go through five years, ten years of challenges. Hang in there, nevertheless. I wish you only go through one day. But the truth is, sometimes it will be extended. Never quit. If you fall, rise up again and walk again. Find out where we've gone wrong and make sure we don't repeat the mistake. The next round when I pray for the sick, I told myself, handle the doubt first. Handle the unbelief first. Don't do what I've done with the old lady in Pontiana when I lay hands on her quieter. Now when I pray for the sick, I come to the sick person with this conviction. For God to heal you is simple. Remember one time it was in a meeting like this, somewhere in Miri. It was a Christmas meeting. It was an evangelistic meeting. There was an altar call. And this lady came out. He was telling me, Pastor, I, I completely forgotten about it. And a few years ago, she called me and to tell me, say, Pastor, remember when you, I came forward to be prayed for, I told you, Pastor, my kidney has kidney stones. And they have thousands of stones. Inside. I don't know how true. If you're a medical person, maybe, you know, you, you may test, you may correct me if I'm wrong, but that was what they say. And I remember, Pastor, you said this to me, for God to do healing upon your body, it is easy for God. Notice I have learned to move from my failure in Pontiana to this position now. And when I told her, for God to do this, it's simple for God. If you believe, God is able to do it. She said she believed. And I prayed. I did the easy part. Friends, I pray. You can pray. That's easy, right? You can pray. That's easy for you. Come on. I pray. That's the easy part for me. I prayed for her. No news from her. Ten years later, I'm wondering, what took you so long? Stories like this, you must call me instantly. Don't wait ten years. But he took her ten years. Call me. Pastor We are you the one who... Uh, yeah, I'm the one... Uh, Oh, just to tell you, Pastor we, you know, from that day onwards, the pain that was so unbearable, which the doctor told me I must go for surgery, that was so unbearable. You told me it is easy for God. Do you know from that day onwards, that I never had any trace of pain anymore in my physical body. Now, friends, we move from that point to that point because we have learned our lesson well. Do you understand what I'm trying to say here? Water experience. Come, stand together with me, please. I thought I would keep the time by 5.30. Now it's 5.44. Now let's pray, huh? I just want to pray that, you know, if you are going through that challenges phase in your life, I want to persuade you to hang in there. Can you do so, my friends? For your coming breakthrough, for your forthcoming victories, for your forthcoming, you know, uh, works of God, hang in there, please. God will see you through. That is my confidence in God. Amen. That is my encouragement in God that He will see you through. Are you ready? If you are discouraged this evening, will you tell God, God, I'm discouraged, help me. God, I'm disappointed, help me. But you must rise up. Come on, friends. Build yourself, build yourself, build yourself, build yourself, build yourself. Go into the Word. Go into the Word. Go into the Word. Go into the Word. Don't be allergic to the Word. Don't be a stranger to the Word. Don't. Go to the Word. Go to the Word. Go to the Word. Go to the Word. That's where faith will come. Father, this afternoon, these precious people in the sanctuary and those following the service online. Many of us are walking on waters now. Testing times, challenging times. 
I ask God for strength, God. I ask God for faith to arise. I ask God for workings of the miracles of God. I ask God that you will do your work, oh God. God, let faith arise in the powerful name of Jesus. I take authority over the discouragement. I take authority over the, de be the, the de delusional attitude. Doubt, unbelief. I break it right now in Jesus' name. Wherever we are standing in this sanctuary, in our homes, Lord, Spirit of God, I ask you to breathe upon us, touch us in Jesus' name. Let your hand touch our life in Jesus' name. Let your hand touch our life in Jesus' name. Let your hand touch our life in Jesus' powerful name. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah, God. Worship you, God. Wonderful God, wonderful God. Strengthen the church. Strengthen the folks in this church. God, strengthen in the powerful name of Jesus. Strengthen in the powerful name of Jesus. Strengthen. Strengthen, oh God. Hallelujah. Let your presence begin to soak and saturate everyone. From the crown of their head to the tip of their toe, let your presence anointing touch us. Lord, let there be a change within us taking place. Thank you, God. Lord, a commitment to know your word, to read your word. God, touch your people, I pray. Touch your people, I pray. Touch your people, oh God. God, sovereignly, for the lack of time, sovereignly, God, you will just visit these people in the premise here, in the homes. Visit us, oh God. Thank you, God. What's the church? In Jesus' powerful name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you.